Hello and welcome to the Dissidents Podcast, part of the Institute for Liberal Values. This is where we discuss how we can strive for a world in which freedom and reason are at the forefront of all human society. In this week's podcast, Elizabeth Spivak and I will be discussing academic mobbings and critical social justice. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, Okay, so today we're going to talk about academic mobbing. Um, And it's an article called Academic Mobbing, a Hidden Hazard at Workplace by S.B. Chu, Ku, I think. Sorry if I've mispronounced that. Um, And I I think this is a great little article. Um, Probably when you listen to this, you probably have a fairly good idea of what academic mobbing is. Um, You might also be thinking that yeah, I, you know, academic mobbing is not just academic mobbing. I mean, we've got ideological mobbing that's happening everywhere um, in campuses, but businesses as well, corporations, um, libraries, um, all over the board. Um, I, I would contend that I think that this phenomenon has largely started from the university and spilled out as people have graduated and taken these ideas elsewhere, or simply that the ideas have become fashionable. Um, and of course, they're, they're easy to exploit one of the podcasts we did uh, a week ago or so was looking at how certain nefarious individuals can exploit this kind of um, ideological stuff. Um, yeah, a couple of, you know, I read several um, articles about workplace mobbing and, mm-hmm. and they always, you know, so specifically workplace, I mean, generally workplace mobbing, and mm-hmm. they often mention um, academic mobbing. Uh, they sort of start out talking about it as a subset, but they what they describe is that academia is sort of, a per, a sort of ripe for this kind of thing because of this, the um, sort of vague ways that people are evaluated and the multitude of ways people are evaluated. So it's, it's um, one of the reasons I think why academia tends to come up as really as so many of the examples of workplace mobbing is because it's sort of well situated for uh, sort of uh I don't know, the manipulation and, and, uh, and that kind of uh, sort of vagueness and multitude of ways that people are evaluated. So, so this is really important because I think that there are ideological reasons um, why, well, I mean, you know, the university is the origin point for ideology, right? Um, and I think that there are ideological reasons why mobbing comes from the universities, that there are certain ideological features i would say in 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 certainly in critical race theory and and i just want to put my hands up here i'm not saying that all critical race theory is bad or that the scholars who engage in it don't have anything to offer um or god forbid i'm certainly not suggesting that anybody should silence them or ban critical race theory Um, i know that there are people out there who are saying that i'm not one of them uh, and i would very much argue against that kind of position if given the opportunity that said, um, there are problems with the ideology, I think, um, that enable it to be exploited um, by nefarious types. And we've talked about this in podcasts previously, um, who will seek to sometimes exploit genuine bigotry um, in order to kind of achieve some some, some sort of social status gains for themselves, so gains for themselves. Um uh, sometimes they'll exaggerate it. Sometimes they'll outright invent it. I mean, I, Elizabeth and I have been on the receiving end of people just inventing it, you know, arguing that we have implied or said things that we would never say or imply and would argue very vociferously against somebody if they did imply or say that. So it happens. That, but that's not to say that the ideology itself is bad, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Um First, I think we need, I mean, you probably have a decent idea of what what we mean by academic mobbing, but just in case, Elizabeth, could you give us something a bit yeah. more robust? Yeah, I mean, I do, I do think I should read it because yeah. it's, it is different um, a little bit. I think many people might think that um, it would be the same as bullying, but I think it's more, um, uh, it's, it's much more than, ju- than I say just bullying as if just bullying weren't bad enough. Right. Um, but, um, okay. So, um, mobbing is a form of organizational pathology in which coworkers essentially gang up on 
and engage in an ongoing ritual of humiliation, exclusion, unjustified accusations, emotional abuse, and general harassment in their malicious attempt to force a targeted worker out of the workplace. It usually begins with one person who decides that he or she is threatened by a colleague and thus begins a desperate campaign that spreads through the workplace like a disease, infecting person after person with the desire to eliminate the target. People resort to mobbing to cover up their own weaknesses and deficiencies. Colleges and university campuses are common grounds for this nonviolent, polite, sophisticated kind of, of mobbing culture. If professors aim to put a colleague down, a clever and effective strategy is to wear the target down emotionally by shunning, gossip, ridicule, bureaucratic hassles, and withholding deserving rewards. Uh, so I think that's, that's, you know, that's beyond bullying, right? Um, certainly it contains elements of bullying, but it's beyond that. And I think that um, some of what you and I have um, experienced and, and much of what, uh, you know, a lot of we have read and others have read is, I would say, nonviolent, polite, sophisticated kinds of, uh, of bullying. Where, and I don't mean sophisticated in terms of, you know, sophisticated arguments or anything like that, but I just mean using the system against a person, um, you know, in order to humiliate, in order to wear them down, in order to make them miserable, to, to ostracize them. Quite interestingly, though, the, 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 the form, this kind, this kind of mobbing, exactly how it's being described here is still happening. Um, but recently there's been a kind of a little bit of a spin on this kind of mobbing in which they will just tell you to shut the fuck up and call you a fucking arsehole and the rest of it, right? <laughs> Do you know what the ideological justification for this is? It's quite interesting. No, <laughs> but I guess? might prefer that. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> See, um, here's an example, right? So so some some people were doing that with me, right? You know, shut the fuck up. Yes. Rah, 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 rah. Yeah. You know, you're just a fucking white male and, you know, all this kind of bollocks, right? And I was responding to them very politely. And I pointed out, look, throughout this conversation, I've been very calm, measured and polite. And I've tried to do your arguments some justice and respond to them. And I've also said that it's important that you say what you say, but I've not told you to shut the fuck up or anything like that. Could we have a modicum of respect? Can you guess what their answer to that was? Uh, no, except that maybe you had inspired them to. Your tone yeah. policing. Oh, how so, interesting! So, so what they what they try to argue? What they try to argue is so that, they um, they like bait you. So they, into... I know, of course, what they want to do, what they want to do, right? What, what? Then this is, by the way, here's a tactical insight. I mean, I've kind of covered this before in many podcasts, but they will always be trying to bait you, right? They, they, yeah. they, they want you to go. Well, I meant in this specific part. way. That's a, that's a, a, you know. So the tone policing. So what, yeah. yeah. So what they're saying is, okay, tone policing. So white people have created the rules of civility. The game is rigged in their favor because, you know, civility is something that, is, that white people do. Therefore, insisting upon civility is white supremacy and, to, and an example of racism in and of itself. <laughs> oh, I'm, like, uh, I'm just yeah. like, just when I think that I, that, you know, I, I, it just, it's exhausting. I mean, yeah, it's I mean, if you go, if you go into Google and you type in t tone policing white supremacy, you'll find, you know, you'll find idiots yeah. and they are. Well, I mean, I don't know. They, they might be halfway bright but they're not these these people are not good people who are trying to manipulate language yeah. in this way so so yeah it, it, and certainly in the past it would have been polite it might not be polite anymore if you want to see an example of this um look at the evergreen videos um with eric weinstein um and you know there are students who are being very 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 uh rude and openly aggressive um and so i think it i think it's kind of moved on um from the point where it would have once have been polite and, and I, i'm sure the polite stuff does happen too um but it's not necessarily a prerequisite uh anymore for mobbing but they can well, be quite open i think rude. yeah i think though that as we go through sort of the um the the um the mobbing activities, mm. we will see elements of both of those. Things, right, 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 right. Right. And I, I, I should point out too, that this article, um, uh, predates by, by many years. Right. It's 2010, uh, isn't it? Yes. And the book, and I say the book because, you know, the, it's, you know, 
the person who wrote the book on uh, mobbing is um, West Hughes. So um, the envy of excellence, administrative mobbing of high achieving professors. Now he uh, has just apparently released a new, um, an updated version of the book with a new foreword. And I read the new foreword, but I have not read the book. So I cannot, uh, I cannot speak to the book, but it is sort of the, the origin and it, um, um, it's 2005. Oh. So I think that's really interesting that, um, that something that we see now, um, you know, as, uh, you know, has been called workplace mobbing, you know, has these, uh, elements, maybe, Cancel culture is a sub element of workplace uh, mobbing, right? That certain a certain sort of perfect storm of events have have come together to reveal a new vulnerability, a new way to um, to attack, uh, a new way to do what has been done so, before. So this is a really, 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 really vital point that we need to hit on. Um, and I, I think we've kind of alluded to it before, but, it, but you know, it's, it's so important that we say this. You know, if we've got people in 2010 um, describing cancel culture and 2005 describing basically cancel culture or academic mobbing, you know, a form of cancel culture, if you like, you know, all of the kind of ideological intolerance that we see now, well, it, it, it can't be purely derived from things like critical race theory. It can't be. Because critical race theory was around in 2005. It was, a, you know, it was well established in 2005. You know, I mean, you know, it was, it was established in the 80s, really. I mean, you know, if you let that, you know, Mapping the Margins, Kimberly Crenshaw, that was published, I think, 1989. And so, you know, that, those ideas are, you know, intersectionality. These ideas are really, really big. They're already, they were already in universities when I was an undergraduate. You know, when I was an undergraduate um, in 2000, I think it was, um, you know, we had safe spaces and stuff like that. It was all there. So one of the points that I want to make is that there are people like, for example, Chris Rufo or, or Governor Ron DeSantis, who would like to make the case that, for example, critical race theory um, is the cause of all of the ideological intolerance that's happening right now. And I think that's wrong. That doesn't mean that I, I don't have a problem with lots of critical race theory. Plenty of critical race theorists have a problem with other parts of critical race theory, right? <laughs> um, you know, you know, if you're, if your number one genre is horror movies, probably the movie that you hate the most is going to be a horror movie, right? Because right. it's kind of like, right. it, it's doing something bad with a kind of body of work that, that you really like and you think is important. And, and I think the same is true of critical race theory. Um, I have problems with it. Um, but, but my, you know, the problems I have with critical race theory are kind of problems that I would like to hash out with critical race theorists. Um, I mm. don't, you know, and, and I think that they should hash out amongst themselves and to an extent they are. Um, I don't think that critical race theory is designed to cause these problems. And this right. is, this is, this is the key mistake that I think is being made by people. You know, it's one thing saying that critical race theory has this issue. It's being abused. Um, and I think that what we've shown or what we've alluded to, certainly in the last two podcasts, two, three podcasts has been, look, you know, this is how people will exploit, um, and abuse and manipulate this kind of theory. So, mm -hmm. you know, my comparison would be, um, a brand new computer. Let's say critical race theory is a computer uh, and it has a task that it wants to achieve. And let's say that task is ending racism. Now you could look at the computer from an analytical point of view and you could say, well, okay, does it do a good job? Is it well equipped to tackle the problem of ending racism? And I, I think that there are serious problems in its design to tackle racism, right? but that's kind of a separate discussion. It is designed to tackle racism, whether or not it's doing a good job at it. Okay. That's an interesting discussion that needs to be had, but that doesn't really get at the central problem that I have with critical race theory. Um, and the central problem I have with critical race theory is not that it wasn't designed to do good things because I think that it was. Um, and I'm not even particularly as interested in whether or not it's doing a good job. Um, 
although again, I am interested in that, but that's not the key, the key thing. What I'm interested in, what I think is, 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 is most vital to, to the podcast that we're doing right now is that critical race theory, if you imagine it like a computer, it has a security exploit, right? It has uh, an error in its operating system, if you like, that allows hackers to get in and mm-hmm. to subvert that computer's resources, its processor, its memory, um, away from tackling racism, which is what it was designed to do, and into spreading malware to other computers, right? Mm-hmm. For example. And so what I think is happening is I think that people are abusing, manipulating, and exploiting critical race theory because of that security flaw that it has, you know, and they're using it to bully people so as to gain social status for themselves. And the name of that security flaw is standpoint epistemology. Um, and I'm not even saying that standpoint epistemology is bad either. You know, right. stand, the, 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 there is a reason why people in critical race theory insist upon standpoint epistemology. And, 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 and it's a very good reason. If you want to know what being the victim of racism feels like, then you are going to get a much better approximation of that if you speak to a genuine victim, you know, if you just try and imagine it in your own head, you, you'll get some of the way there, right? You'll, you'll, you'll understand that it's bad. You'll maybe feel uncomfortable, but you'll get a much better approximation if you actually speak to somebody who went through it. If you want to know what the Holocaust felt like, um, if there's any left, speak to somebody who was in, you know, a Belson or an Auschwitz. They will give you a much better approximation than an actor could for example right. although the actor would do a pretty good job right you know if you watch schindler's list you'll probably cry so right. you, you can get some of the way there so, so the, the the insistence on standpoint epistemology is, is is understandable um to an extent justified and also does yield some good results it will give you a much better understanding um however it has like a security exploit and that is that nefarious characters can come in and pretend to be victims when they're not and use, um, uh, uh, by the way, if you don't think that people will do this, you're being extremely naive. People will do all kinds of things uh, in order to to, to, to to get a leg up in society. For the, yeah, for the smallest of rewards. Right. right? Yeah. In fact, maybe more so for the smallest of, of rewards. Uh, yeah. Because then maybe they, they feel that uh, they, you know, it's like, but, you know, it's, it was it was a small thing. It was a small abuse of power for a small gain, and so therefore that's what everybody does. And I'm just doing what everybody else does. And it's not like we don't have a nuanced perspective of this. I mean, to give you an example of standpoint epistemology, um, believe hashtag believe all women. Right. So, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It was both. Right. It's a good thing, because if you look at sexual assault and rape, for the the vast majority of the time, this happens between two adults in closed doors. And so, you know, having that reasonable of doubt standard of evidence is really hard to get to because there's nobody there to witness it. And this is being exploited by sexual predators that they know that that that's true and they're exploiting it in order to do some pretty horrendous stuff. So if you start to bring in something like believe all women and suddenly we believe the women, even though we know that it doesn't meet that kind of objective standard of evidence, then we can go after sexual predators. And that's great. That's useful. And and, and, and some people who have been behaving really badly have been apprehended and mobbed as a consequence good you know, sometimes a mobbing might actually serve a good purpose i you know personally if there's a sexual predator um on your campus uh, a mobbing get them the fuck out of there um I, I think that's a good you know that's a good thing you know that person is a danger and they can exploit that kind of liberal standard of evidence so it can be a good thing but at the same time you if, if you don't think that this will not be exploited by bad people and there are some bad women you know not all women are lovely um just as there are bad men, if you don't think that bad people will not exploit that, then you're simply being naive in face of overwhelming evidence because it, it happens. Um, you know, famously the Johnny Depp thing, for example, when you know, it was alleged that he did all kinds of things that now she didn't allege he participated in sexual violence, but I think she alleged he participated in physical violence and all kinds of things that, that, that it now seems clear he didn't do. Um, well, certainly according to 
the, the court. So, right, 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 right. <laughs> so, so, so the point is, is that things that can be good, that can have a positive impact will be exploited. I don't want to come out and say that critical race theory is behind of all, of, all of this stuff because it existed in a time, also existed in a time when this kind of persecution wasn't happening. Um, but I think that it has a part to play because it has that, you know, exploit that, 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 that feature, which is standpoint epistemology, which can be justified, but it can also be manipulated. It's easy to manipulate and abuse in order to start making baseless accusations and claim victimhood status as a consequence. So I think that's an important thing because I, I think that much of the anti-woke resistance is missing that point. They, they seem to think that critical race theory was designed to benefit these people. And it, and I really disagree with that. And, and, and I think that the solution to counter to cancel culture will involve critical race theorists, you know, dealing with this problem, this security exploit in their own theory, not pretending it doesn't exist. And in mm. this article, one of the things that they're talking that the, you know, the, I mean, this, this author, we picked this article because it's just so approachable. I mean, it, it's, it's short, it's got, you know, lists and tables and, and, you know, this is not this rec this is not this author's theory or anything like that. She is presenting it, um, you know, for her, you know, sort of FYI for your information. Um, this is likely happening and, uh, to, you know, people, you know, or maybe to you and you should be aware of it. So, but one of the things that, um, you know, that, you know, again, this, you know, people were writing about this before cancel culture was a thing, 2005. Well, the, say. Well, well, and what we call cancel culture was a thing, right? Well, <laughs> it was, well exactly, yeah. exactly. And, um, and so, you know, one of the things that they're talking about in here, just like, you know, like maybe critical race theorists and, and so need to deal with that there's, you know, problem in their own problems in their own house, right? You know, um, there are also problems in organizations where organizations are facilitating this, are um, looking the other way, are, um, you know, their, their, their system you know, they have systems in place that have similar flaws, as you, you know, as you're mentioning, flaws that allow people to essentially hack the, uh, you know, the, um, maybe the evaluation process or, um, you know, certain kinds of communications, uh, meetings, that kind of thing in order to, uh, to exploit those flaws and use it to, uh, in this case, you know, to, in, for workplace mobbing. Yeah, I, I like the I like the metaphor hack because I think that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with hackers um, that are you know attempting to subvert systems that are, that are designed to do good um, in order to serve their own nefarious purposes, which ends up costing the system itself, right? Exactly. I mean, it's it costs it costs the organizations. Um, they lose good people. Um, and then you have to go through the hiring process and the training process and, and, and all that kind of thing all over again. Um, they, you know, people are engaging in behaviors that are off task, right? They're spending emotional energy, physical energy, um, you know, mental, res uh, you know, intellectual resources, doing things that are not productive. They're not productive, you know, in terms of, of, of the, the relationships at work. You know, when, when people are at work, people are more productive when they, uh, when they get along in work groups, uh, for reasons that you might not think of, um, when somebody's out sick and, and a work group, you know, ha has good relationships, what do they do? They answer each other's phone, right? If the phone rings, they, they, they pick it up. If, um, that if somebody drops something on the desk of somebody that, that, um, you know, had to leave to go pick up a kid, they'll, they'll go over and, and say, Oh, I'll take care of that for that person. Right. Um, I'll cover for you on, you know, so on such and such a meeting. I'll finish that report for you. Um, and then so people are working together and, you know, the, an offshoot of that is cross training. At, so this is cross training that's informal. Right. Where people are covering for each other, they're talking to one another, they're editing each other's work, whatever it is that, you know, that that is required in this work group. They're they're doing informal cross training, which then makes everyone 
a better uh, a better asset in the organization. So when when uh, organizations allow something like workplace mobbing, it undermines trust, it undermines cooperation, it and it undermines these relationships that actually are helping the uh, the organization work better. Yeah, and, and just to reiterate that, with regards to critical race theory, like um, you know, I've spoken to critical race theorists who have looked at examples of cancel culture and would say that's absolutely terrible. <laughs> they recognize that it's happening. Um, but then, you know, what you, what you do is you get people on the right, you know, again, the likes of Chris Rufo, who would say um, critical race theory is racist against white people. It seeks to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and a critical race theorist would quite rightly point out, would go, well, hold on, that's not what we're arguing. You know, a critical race theorist would say that, no, we're not saying that people who are genetically white are any more or less evil than people who are genetically black. What we are saying is that um, for the purposes of, to justify the horrors of colonialism and slavery, this idea of white people being superior was, was made real right? It was reified um, in, so that they could say, well, okay, white people are superior, therefore, you know, they can, we can justify the abuse of black people, which was also reified, made real as being inferior. And what they argue is that that kind of social categorization has, you know, s still exists today to an extent. And it's a fairly good point. You know, I'm, I'm not saying they're entirely wrong about that either. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, you know, you, someone with Chris Rufo would say it's racist against white people. And then you, the, the critical race theory, defense is a fairly good one and then they would say that what critical what what chris rufo was saying about critical race theory he'd said that that's he's making it up it's a straw man and to an extent they're right because he is but to an extent they're also wrong <laughs> because there are people who are using you know using a very dumbed down version of critical race theory to do exactly what chris rufo was saying so Chris Rufo is both wrong and right. There are critical race theorists or people who call themselves critical race theorists. People I would say are exploiting um, that ideological movement and are behaving, but are behaving exactly that way. So the kind of the, the, the right wing straw man is real. You know, those, those people do actually exist. But at the same time, there are critical race theorists who, you know, absolutely are not racist against white people and think that the idea that people should be racist against white people is absolutely preposterous. So this is the kind of complex and nuanced world we live in. Um, so again, it comes back to it being manipulated and abused rather than it being designed to do bad. So, um, so I just thought that I would, um, again, to sort of summarize what we were just talking about organizational dynamics, particularly culture and leadership values and beliefs may foster and reinforce workplace mobbing management may participate in or actually initiate the mobbing or may know that lower level management is harassing employees, but will not intervene. Um, so that's, you know, um, the organization is also responsible. It's not just at the end of an individual level. It's also uh, the organization. So I kind of wanted to talk about the, um, the, uh, the sort of activities. Well, there's the activities and then there's the phases of mobbing. I don't know that we need to do both. Should we just do the phases of mobbing? I think that's the easiest one you, to resonate with. To... I don't mind doing both, but yeah. I think that the, yeah. the, the phases is going to be the thing that people identify with most. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so the, so, um, and, and the, the, the author, you know, does say, you know, that, um, and she, you know, she's, uh, again, she's summarizing other people's um, work. But once the phases begin, they develop their own uh, momentum. So um, so phase one is some some critical incident. So some conflict is is created that may be real or imagined, right? Yep, in our case um, imagined. <laughs> In both yeah. cases, imagine. <laughs> yes. Um, and it, you know, so something, some kind of conflict, some sort of, you know, internal organizational flaw, you know, software flaw, to use your metaphor, um, is, is sort of not managed. It's lingering. Um, and it sort of, you know, 
uh, begins to compound. So the target is maybe accused of, of something like um, an insensitive remark. That's what it says right here. Yeah. So I'm not making that no, up. So, I mean, let, let's give some examples of this, right? Let's let's give some, some so, so, you know, you might get mobbed if you genuinely say something that's racist. Right. In which case, you know, so you, but you might also get mobbed if you say something that has been construed, I would argue deliberately misconstrued um, to, to, to be racist or sexist or homophobic or whatever. Um, so some examples of this, um, and, and we can get these from the concept of microaggression, which is again, falling back on this standpoint epistemology, like whatever happens to me, I can completely get away with, you know, it's what I'm, what, how I feel is important. And I can tell you what your intentions are, that kind of thing. So, um, okay, Elizabeth, let's say, uh, you got a haircut and a male colleague said, oh, have you cut your hair? It looks very nice. How do you feel about that? Um, well, do you want me to take the, uh, <laughs> oh, somebody noticed and, and that's, that's kind of cool. Right. I mean, somebody noticed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I, I think for, for, for most people, most of the time, if somebody says, you know, that's a nice haircut that you've got or that new t-shirt looks good on you. I, I think that that's a fairly positive thing to say about somebody. And I think that a psychologically, and I have to defer to the psychologist here, but I think a psychologically healthy response would be, thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> um, glad I'm not off point on that one. Um, however, that's an example of sexual harassment now. Um, and this is actually in the code of conduct of many universities there in black and white, that you can't comment on somebody's appearance at all. And so, you know, this could be an example of a critical incident. Um, and if you've got somebody who's, let's say, an older professor who's grown up in a culture wherein that kind of comment was actually considered good manners, you know, you sh not only is it nice to say that, you should actually say it because it would be good manners. Um, now that person can be, you know, targeted. It's a critical, you've committed an act of sexual harassment. Um, another one, you know, famous one, again, this sounds ridiculous, but this is in the code of conduct of many universities. Um, you meet somebody who clearly is not from America or Britain or France or whatever country you live in. And um, you say, oh, where are you from? Right. Now that's, again, that's an example of othering. So this could be an example of a critical incident. You've, you've, you've othered them. You've made them to feel different because you want to, you know, highlight yourself as being better. Another one that I've been accused of um somebody who was complaining that their English wasn't very good, a foreign lecturer, uh, not foreign actually, but a lecturer who was complaining that their English wasn't very good. Uh, uh, she, she, this person came from another country to England or America. Um, and I simply said, wow, that's nonsense. Your English is excellent. That was considered to be a microaggression. So all of these, you know, you see how easy it is to create these, you know, this conflict. Well, and I, I think this article actually makes it clear that the person may not have done any of those things. No, I, yeah, again, in, in, in my case, um, and in your case, and yours is the most egregious one, my, mine was pretty egregious, but I managed to stop it before it did as much damage as yours, it did do me damage, but not as much as yours did to you, because I basically won in the end. But um, with you, they took a piece, you, you had a re piece of reported speech, it wasn't something you were claiming, it was for a study. You wanted to see how people would react to this piece of reported speech, but asserting it, you weren't saying people should say this. You believed it, none of that. And the participant, the person who exploited that knew that. And they just said, this is what was being said. And it was just completely invented. So yeah, it could be just completely imagined. Um, yeah. And so, and it doesn't have to, yeah. To, yeah. So um, it doesn't so have to be these, real or no, have any grounding these, in reality. Right. These these real or, or perceived accusations give justification uh, to take some sort of um, uh, actions as we move forward. So that's phase one where there's some incident. And and again, I mean, they they don't use your metaphor of the software flaw, but, you know, it's an organizational conflict that is not managed, lingers on and subsequently compounds. So there's some, you know, some sort of you know, again, it could be a remark, it could be a, you know, a, a not showing up for a meeting. Oh, one of the things I was, you know, I was accused of. So 
I, well, while a presentation was going on, I took my camera off. So now I couldn't see myself. I couldn't see anybody's face because I was watching the presentation in a Zoom. So it filled my entire screen. I did not see any reason why I would have my camera on or that anyone would be looking for me. But one of the things that I was accused of was not being interested. And my lack of interest was demonstrated by my not having my camera on during a presentation. During the discussion, of course, I did have my camera on. But so these are things, you know, like, you know, little... Yeah, uh, I mean, having your camera off does not demonstrate you might have your camera off because yeah. you're disinterested. That might be the cause, but there could be a yes. number of other reasons why you would have your camera exactly. off. Exactly. I was actually attending to, like, actually being attentive. I don't know about you all, but uh, it is actually very distracting to see myself on camera or to see other people. If I had the view where I see other people and they're like eating their lunch and drinking and talk, their kids are, are in and out, their dogs, their cats walk across the screen. I find that that, that does not actually facilitate my attentiveness. So anyway. And it might be different for other people, but you, you, you know. Right. I, 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 yeah. So, um, okay. So, th so these, uh, some critical incidents. Okay. So that's phase two. Uh, phase one, phase two, uh, mobbing and, and stigmatizing. So phase two consists of, um, some sort of aggressive, maybe aggressive acts, psychological assaults against the target with intent to get the person or punish him or her. Um, and the aggressive aggression often manifests itself in terms of, uh, criticism, insulting comments, whispers, other insidious behavior, uh, the effect of which is, um, you know, and attempts to humiliate, intimidate, um, and, and make the target fearful. Um, and, uh, in phase two is when other people sort of get co-opted into the mobbing process. So it isn't just one person who's offense, uh, offended or whatever. And in terms of my example, um, so I got, I have gotten, uh, over the two years, a series of emails. And one of the common themes in the emails is that there'll be a sentence that says, people are saying. So people are saying that you're not uh, committed to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Or people are saying that if you really did care about diversity, equity, inclusion, you would do thus and so. You would say this thing. You would not, people are saying that you would not say that diversity, um, you know, uh, is expansive, you know, to maybe political diversity or other kinds of groups if you really care, because that's not the kind of diversity that we're interested in. So people are saying that, you, you know, so this is a kind of a, you know, um, you know, a criticism, kind of, you know, sort of co-opting other people into it and, and, you know, sort of making the, the target, you know, feel embarrassed, guilty, humiliated, ostracized. Do you know what they did with me? One of the things they did with me, and then I want you to kind of predict how I responded to it. It was very, very fun. Like people like when people try, try and take me on, one of the mistakes that they, they make is they think that I'm, I might be conflict averse. And I'm very, not, no, <laughs> not, not even remotely. Um, so one of the things they did with me was they would leave notes on my door in my office. Mm, yes. I think actually they, they talk about, they mentioned that, like they, they, they mention in here, uh, uh, you know, conversation via post-its. They don't call it post-its. They say, they say yellow slips or something like that. Cause, but she means post-it. She just couldn't say post-it. So, yeah. so can, can, can. Can you guess how I responded to the post-its? You I, probably put your own post-its yeah, up. Yeah, it became a yeah. debate. It became a debate. Yeah. And I just started ripping them apart on logical fallacies. <laughs> like, this is an ad hominem. This is, are you calling yourself an academic? You don't know this? This is high school. Really? I'm embarrassed for you. And <laughs> just going through and absolutely ripping them. And they stopped. <laughs> but it was so much fun for me just to have that little bit of like, because they, they were completely anonymous. I have no idea who was doing it. Uh, well, I have um, no idea. I have some idea. But... All of a sudden, is all of a sudden uh, his name escapes me. Um, the one that was at in uh, at Portland, with Portland State. Oh, Peter um, Bogosian. Peter Bogosian. People they were doing that to him. They they would he would come to work sometimes, and he would find a letter. You know, suppose like sign like sort of 
signed like your colleagues or whatever, you know, um, that was just sort of designed to, yeah, to make him feel. I've, I've had that as well. Anonymous complaints made about me, um, about stuff that I didn't do. Um, I, I've also, another thing that happened, um, I think I told you this example probably on a number of occasions. Um, but I was working with one of my colleagues who was gay and, um, he wasn't fond of all of this ideological stuff or the bullying. And he said something about it. He said, no, this is not on this kind of bullying is, is not fair. It's not right. You know, you know, really decent principled guy. Um, but being gay wasn't part of his identity. You know, he, he was quite a conservative kind of chap was, it was, he wasn't secret about it, but he didn't talk about it. You know what I mean? It wasn't something that he brought up because he was quite a private person. Fair enough. If you're gay, you don't have to be going around, I'm gay, you know, just like you, like straight people don't. <laughs> go to, By the way, I'm straight. <laughs> that might be another conflict incident. Um, yeah. Um, but, um, you know, um, and the next thing that happened was um, an anonymous complaint from a member of staff was made about him sexually harassing a student, a female student because he touched her inappropriately on the arm. Oh. No, no complaints you know from what? female students, by the way. No, no, no. Yes. But yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's uh, phase two. So we got some stigmatizing going on. Phase, phase three, personnel management. So this is the period in which administration enters into the mobbing, usually after, of course, they've ignored and, you know, minimized it uh, so far. Um, but now there's been several do documented, and I use the term, you know, loosely documented incidents, right? So when administration gets involved now, it's like, oh, well, you know, we have, you know, maybe, you know, several, again, real or imagined incidents that, that, uh, that administration can, um, can misjudge, um, or used to blame the target. Um, and of course, the easiest thing is to what get rid of the target, right? I mean, that's, um, this often results in a serious violation of the, indiv the target's individual rights. Um, but because of the fundamental attribution error, which um, I don't know, if, uh, just to make sure people know, the fundamental attribution error is uh, our tendency to assign internal causes to behaviors. So the assumption is that people are not situationally behaving, but they are behaving because of their internal, um, you know, their, their personality, their internal motives, their drives, um, their values, that kind of thing. So, um, for example, somebody steals, uh, you know, a loaf of bread, they stole it because they are what? They are a thief, not because they are hungry or they have a hungry child at home or something like that. So the fundamental attribution error is the, um, is our tendency to, uh, ignore situational forces in, uh, explaining behavior. So because of the fundamental attribution error, colleges and, um, uh, I'm sorry, colleagues and management tend to create explanations based on personal characteristics rather than the environmental uh, forces. So that's phase three, where management administration uh, starts to get involved in the identification of the target as the problem. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you have an example of that. I certainly you do. You certainly do. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, have, I have to be fair. Um, in none of the organizations that I've been in has it taken rot at this level. Like it's always stopped before it got to, well, it always stopped at this level. Um, I'm not entirely sure why that is, um, but I, I, I know it's got to this level. So for example, with me, um, people were, people I'm not friends with on Facebook, right? It's not like people who are know me on Facebook or whatever, but they were like stalking me on Facebook to find out, find me saying things in certain groups on Facebook. They would then screenshot it completely out of context and say, look, this is evidence that he was arguing for X, Y, and Z. And I demand that there were, there would be discipline made against him. Um, and there was none taken against me. 
Um, another example I had that they tried to do against me is that I was um, talking about, somebody said, some student, I think, asked me, um, said, oh, you've got really nice blue eyes, right? Japanese student. Um, and then I explained why pale skin and blue eyes came into being, which was because people moved out of Africa and into Europe, which was covered by largely oak forests, um, dark winters, shorter days, um, colder climate, um, also from the, not just from the sky, but from the canopy of the, the forest. Um, and so people couldn't get enough vitamin D. And for that reason, um, white skin and blue eyes started to become a thing because if you have pale skin, you can get more vitamin D, which is great if you live in Europe in Germany or somewhere like that. It was a big problem if you're in Africa, right? Um, that's why they have darker skin because the melanin protects against the sunlight. You know, it, it, it's adaptation. Neither one is superior or better to the other. And these days it doesn't matter because if you're in a really cold climate like Scotland, for example, where um, black people are encouraged to take vitamin D tablets by the NHS um, because they need to get that vitamin D or their bones will break. If they do get the vitamin D, there's no problem. Um, similarly, um, you and I, if we went on holiday to, uh, well, just me, like now, if I go to the supermarket in Japan in the summer, I walk five minutes, I'm already sunburned, like literally within five minutes of walking. So I have to wear like factor 50. Um, I get sunburned even in winter. Um, so again, great if I'm in a cold, dark forest, not so great if I'm in the Japanese summer. So, so but, but, it, but talking about that is not making any moral judgment. It's just talking about skin color, the differences and where it's come from. It's not saying that somebody is brighter or, 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 or one is better than the other. Actually, that's completely not connected. But somebody who, who overheard that conversation um, then went to management and said, even though I wasn't having that conversation with them, then said that they had been othered by me and they were offended because they thought I was being racist. Not a black person, by the way. <laughs> There's never black people complaining about me. Um, but but yeah, and, and, and management at that point said, actually one person in management I know, um, said, no, that's a scientific fact. <laughs> like, scientific facts can't be racist, um, which led that person- Well, there. definitely at, at my institution, um, administration, you know, d definitely gets well and, and, and continues to, in, not just in my case, but, you know, in other areas uh, as well. Um, they just, they seem to have, um, yeah. I think, I think there's a, a degree of this is anything for an easy day. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I agree completely. Yes. So, but in terms of, of my case, you know, sort of, um, you know, it says, you know, this results in a serious violation of the individual civil rights and, and, you know, it, it um, you know, ends up, you know, the person gets blamed, you know, their characteristics and stuff. So administration met with my research students, for example, and, uh, you know, tried to essentially bully them into, you know, apologizing for sound research design and, um, you know, they kept they kept saying, "Well, you can see you can see how that's uh, racist and and right." And they said, "Well, I can see." I mean, they were prepared and they're really smart kids, and they were like, "You know, well, we can see how someone who saw it out of context and was not aware that this was a a, a survey that to which people had gotten an orientation, signed up for a platform, chose a research study." read a consent document, and then were, was in the process of answering over a hundred questions. If the, somebody did not know any of that context and only read this one sentence, yes, we can see how the, how one might think that's racist, but those are not the people that were in the study. Those are the people that saw a, uh, you know, a, uh, a social media post. Taking those are not the people. Who are, exactly. Taking deliberately um, out of context. Yes. And so, um, administration got very involved. They sent multiple, e uh, multiple all campus and alumni emails, you know, apologizing for us, um, certainly implicating us in, in, um, white supremacy culture. Um, another department sent all, you know, an all campus email, uh, saying the same thing that we were an example of white supremacy culture and that they were uniquely qualified to identify that as the uh, social work department. So this is um, a perfect example 
of, um, you know, of personnel uh, and, and management, um, you know, sort of getting involved um, and sort of entering into the, the mobbing, uh, the mobbing equation and, and scapegoating, you know, getting, to, you know, pointing out that the, you know, that there's a problem here and, uh, you know, it's not the organizational problem. It's not the people who are mobbing. It's the the target. But let's and let's let, let's dwell a little bit on that term scapegoating because you know you need to really it needs to be clear what scapegoating actually achieves. Um, scapegoating is counterproductive, right? It, 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 you know, you think that if you cast all of the blame upon one individual, that maybe it will go away. You might even think, okay, Spivak's probably not a racist, but she speaks her mind a bit too much and she should just pipe down and everything would be a lot smoother. If she just apologized, everything would be great. And, you know, we can all have an easy day and those people can go and be eccentrics and everything will just settle down. No, 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 it won't. You might get a little bit of that effect in the, in the short term. You know, you, you probably you will. Um, but after a while, these people will continue to behave in the same way. They will find new targets. Um, I mean, that's in the literature. That's, that's my experience. Um, the people who targeted me, I, I mean, I pushed back, so they didn't, it didn't get very far with me. I mean, it did do me some psychological damage, that's for sure, but it didn't, you know, I, I think I broadly won. People didn't side with them. And then they just went after other people, you know, right. making stuff up, you know. Right. And, and so it, it creates a, certainly creates a culture of fear in those who are not actively engaging in the mobbing any you know anyone who's a bystander or whatever you know they're just um they either have to you know go along to get along um uh or you know risk uh being a target themselves and uh and they may still not be able to avoid that even if they do no even uh, if they join participate. in right i know no, right. i've seen it i've seen um um you know i've seen people who were previously woke get targeted in fact mm -hmm. didn't we have um didn't somebody approach us at heterodox somebody who was previously woke and then became a target apologized to you yes yes a young woman um who said that she had actually participated in canceling you know calling out her professors in fact and then um several years later guess what you know who knows what she did or posted or whatever. Uh, but I think it was beyond college. I think it was after college, maybe that she did something as people came after her and it made her realize um, how uh, <laughs> maybe, um, you know, in maturity also, I mean, she, you know, I'm sure that that had something to do with it, helped her to realize. I, I mean, I, I was talking to um, Eric Beef uh, the other day, whom we interviewed on a podcast. Yeah. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to him and he said, you know, like, how is it, how is it that, that, you know, some people can understand this? And I, and I said, I, I don't think anyone can understand it and truly understand it until it happens to them. I, I really do. Unfortunately, I really do believe that no one can really understand how alienating it is, how truly, uh, you know, um, earth shattering, career shattering, relationship shattering, uh, identity shattering, it can be until it, it happens to you. I really, I really don't think, unfortunately, that uh, there's any vicarious way to, uh, to understand it. I think if you understand what America um, is, uh, what England is as well, what more broadly the West and liberal democracy stands for, you know, the, 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 the modern nation state that we live in today was constructed its identity largely was constructed post world war ii right like when the the big enemy was the fascists you know we never went to war with the communists not really i mean we had a cold war but it wasn't quite the same we went to war with fascism with nazi germany that was um a very very technologically advanced powerful um military state that was exterminating jewish people and you know black people and gypsies and, and homosexuals and you know we have grown up in the aftermath of that there are still people alive today who remember that who fought in that war um when i was younger there were there were a lot of them and i spoke to them i've spoken to many of them um 
you know, the people who fought in that conflict. So our, our identity as Westerners is, is, is very much against racism, in, in, especially in America. Then you have the civil rights movement, um, which forms a huge part of the American identity. Um, and then the rejection of slavery and, and colonialism, more colonialism from a British point of view, although slavery was also a thing, but that's more of identity. So our whole kind of identity has been constructed in opposition to the kind of bigotry and uh, of racism, and rightly so. And so when you, there's nothing worse that you can tar somebody with, really. And and, and so if you're tarred as being uh, 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 certainly racist, I think is the worst of all of them. Like it's not great to be tarred as a homophobe, but I think racism is the most powerful one still. You, once you're tarred with that brush, if that tar sticks where are you where are you supposed to go after that yeah there's yeah, yeah there's where, where, nowhere to go and you you can't argue against there's just there's no argument against it well there is and that's fuck off it doesn't work <laughs> um no um but at least it keeps your dignity intact um you, you know the worst thing you can do is because the worst thing you can do is apologize it's like absolutely the worst thing you can do because you think that, you know, apologizing will give you a break. And this is, you see people doing this all the time. Oh, I am, you know, yeah. now I need to think about my well, actions and all this kind of stuff. It's what universities pressure people to do. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the Hamlin university situation, you know, she, they pressured her to apologize and, uh, and she did and, and she still got, you know, got fired, yeah. um, and, and so on and so forth. And that's certainly what my university tried to do. And when I, when we wouldn't apologize, they apologized for us. Right. So, so let's make this clear. Like not only will apologizing do nothing for you as an individual, except actually it will make things worse because it will lower your resistance. The, 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 the bullies who I would argue are narcissists. They want to make everything about themselves and their victimhood. They will smell the weakness and they will go after you even more. In my, and they'll pick apart your apology and use uh, that as well, right? Um, in my case, I refused to budge an inch. Like, no, not having it. And and I, probably in most situations, that won't work either. But at least it will save some some of your dignity. And also, and this is where I think I'm not being targeted. I haven't been targeted as much, as perhaps. People are afraid to go after me because I will have it with them. I'll have a debate with them and I'll call them on all of their bullshit to their face and I'll win over a few people on the side. And I think they might look at you and they might think, <clears throat> I could tar that person, but there are easier targets out there. So not apologies, right? And, and you know, they'll go for the easier easy, easier targets than you. So, so that's another reason not to apologize and not to break down for, on an individual level. On an organizational level, again, if you think that, look, it's terrible, but let's just get rid of a Burke or a Spivak and everything will be easy. You are deluded. These people have invented offenses against people. Why would they stop at that one person? If you've just empowered them, if you just let them get away with it, they're going to think, whoa, yeah. I can get away it's with a, this and I'm going to do it again and again and again. It's a workplace game. It's a habit of thinking. It's a habit of behaving. And so once one person is gone, there might be a period. I mean, this this is actually true of my workplace. When I, I realize now, 20 years ago, it was going on um, and a couple of people left and it changed, sort of changed the dynamics in the department. And we had like a bit of a honeymoon period. And then, you know, guess what? Um, the, the, you know, the habits were still, were still there. And then we get a new, a new sort of, um, you know, perfect storm of opportunity. And, um, and, you know, here we are again. And, and I believe actually that there were a few incidents in between, but they were less, um, you know, less severe, less, uh, less public, but there certainly were, were other incidents. So, so, um, so if you're an administrator, don't think that the best thing for you to do is to take the easy win and get a, a short period of calm. You know, you might get a short, you might not, by the way, because they might just start going crazy like they did at Evergreen and everything just exploded, right? So you might even not get that, even though you've, you've, you know, you've, okay, let's just go along. We'll get a little, little, no, you might not get that. You may do, you may do, you may or may not, but certainly what you will not get is an extended piece 
than calm because these people will sniff the weakness out. They will think I, I've done this once. I can do it again and I will continue to get personal benefits to me. And I don't give two shits about the damage that I'm doing the organization because they don't care about the organization. If they did, they wouldn't be behaving like this. Maybe you do as an administrator. Maybe you do. Um, and maybe, but, but, but if you think that this is going to be good for your organization, it, it won't be. There's, there's no right. reason to believe that. Yeah. Um, okay. So phase one was critical incident. Phase two, uh, stigma, uh, stigmatizing. Phase three, personnel and management gets involved. Phase four, incorrect diagnosis. I know that this has happened to both of us. Um, the construction of the target as difficult under extreme stress or mentally ill. Yes, employees who express uh, concerns about uh, unethical or, or uh, other kind of, you know, these kinds of behaviors are described as having a negative attitude, being paranoid. Um, if the target seeks contact um, with maybe HR or maybe um, a uh, counselor or something like that, they will also get often the diagnosis of being paranoid or having some sort of adjustment problems. Um, and this judgment can essentially like destroy the sort of mental health, you know, the, the maybe, recovery. Maybe they are paranoid because that's the psychological damage that's being done to them. <laughs> like this is like what happens, you know, if you're a victim of, uh, I mean, okay, here we go. Here's the psychologist. If you're a victim of childhood abuse or if you're a victim of any kind of abuse, you're much more likely to be paranoid than somebody who wasn't or hasn't been you know, like been well yeah and especially if you're still living in the abusive home <laughs> it's like i mean it's like you're we're going to work every day where we're being bullied and you're asking me why i feel like i'm why why i feel like i'm in danger of being bullied you're kidding me i know it's like, like you know like yeah. I, like whenever i meet westerners i always just assume that that they're, they're, they're critical social justice bullies knowing that most of them aren't Knowing that most of them aren't, but it's just safer for me to make that assumption because, you know, a, a significant proportion of them are about 10% probably. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be in a relationship with somebody like that. I'm happy to say, hello, how are you? Going, nice day we're having and all that. And that's it. I don't want to have any kind of relationship with somebody who's, who's going to, and, and by the way, I'm not talking about critical social justice advocates. I'm talking about the narcissists that, that participate in the, the mobbing like this. And that's not all critical social justice people, by the way, they don't all do this. Um, so I, so as early as the first few days of when this happened, um, so I uh, contacted the union because it was academic freedom, uh, an academic freedom issue in my case. And that's supposed to be the, the essentially the strongest language in our academic contracts, which would be around academic freedom. So I contacted them, like, I mean, within an hour, I said, you know, I've been, you know, I, I'm, my academic freedom is, is being attacked by my own colleagues, my department chair, my, you know, um, and so, um, so I met with them and, and they were very, they were very nice and very supportive. I would say for, I think generously a week. <laughs> okay. And after the week was up, um, they started saying things like, maybe you should take a leave of absence. Um, if you're struggling, <coughs> if you're struggling, <coughs> Then, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it would be better for you to, um, you know, to, to take a semester off or to, you know, um, you, maybe you need to get some counseling, um, you know, that, that kind of thing. So they, I mean, again, you know, I'm not saying that, that on a, you know, that they weren't trying in their own way to help me still, maybe in other ways, but they started saying things like that. And then um, it wasn't too long, uh, a few weeks, where they basically just said, well, there's nothing, there's nothing more that, that we can do. And so, um, you know, you're going to have to figure out how to uh, manage this uh, on your own. And, and um, you know, it seems like you're, you're really struggling personally. And, and certainly that's what my, friend, my, my former friends have told me that I've, I've uh, hung on to this too long. I need to get over it. I need, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
no, you don't need to get over it. Um, and you don't need to get over it. Not, not, not only because you've been like a horrible injustice has been visited upon you. Not only because of that. Um, not only because you've been abused and you should demand justice for that, but also for the sake of the institution. This kind of behavior will not stop with you, as you know, right? It, it will go on and other people will become victims. Um, so these people say, oh, look, this is such a banal argument. You know, who is it? Um, I might be misattributing the quote here. I think it was, um, I think it was Winston Churchill that said, all that is needed for evil to prevail is good men do nothing. And women. He didn't mention women, but, you know, he was a man of the 40s. <laughs> well, that's 19th century, actually. But, um, yeah, um, but, 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 but the spirit of the quote is, is quite correct. You know, you don't have to be... I'm not saying if you're one of those people who doesn't do anything because you're scared. I'm not saying that you're evil. I'm not saying that you're a bad person. I get the fear. I feel it myself. But you're letting evil win. You're letting that darkness win. And if you do nothing or you try and say that this person should just be quiet and everything will go away, it, it won't. And it never has done. And it's not just the, the, the evil that we're talking about here in terms of ideological bullying or ideological exploit bullying, as I would call it. Um, but, but, but it's true of every evil in history. You know, what was... Now, I'm not trying to say that, that these kind of ideological bullies are as bad as Nazi Germany. I'm not saying that at all. But what was it that stopped Germany? You know, Neville Chamberlain went across and tried to make peace with them and had a sh shook hands with Hitler and signed a peace treaty between Britain and Germany. And Germany, after the peace treaty, they just continued to expand. Um, and at that point, what it took to stop them was somebody like Churchill to put his foot down and, and, and say no and to stand up against the, the, the Nazi German war machine. And eventually, thanks to the intervention of America and you know, and other people too, um, eventually to win. But, but, but if Britain hadn't stood up to, and this is, again, true of any kind of evil, if you just, you know, you don't have to, if you just say, like, I'm, I, I condemn this, but I'm not going to do anything, then it will win. You have to stand up against it, unfortunately. Otherwise, evil will just consume whatever organisation you work in or, or country. Um, and that's the threat that is being posed to institutions. Right? Good. So ha have you been told that you need to get counseling and, yep. and stuff too? Yeah, you're depressed. I did. You need I, to get I, I, I did. I, no, the great thing is I did go and get counseling. Um, um, I went to a psychiatrist and um, psychiatrist was very, really, really good. It was a Japanese psychiatrist, right? So not yeah, ja psychiatry in Japan has not been infected with all the ideological nonsense yet. Um, but an English speaking Japanese psychiatrist and, um, he went through all of my feelings and what I was going through. And then he was like, well, okay, well, what's causing this? And I showed him the messages I was getting <laughs> and he was, oh, that's probably this is a, a totally problem. appropriate, a totally appropriate, appropriate reaction. reaction. <laughs> and then he, was, he said, you should go to the police um, because actually in Japan, it's a criminal offense. In America, it's a civil offense to, to lie, slander and that kind of thing. Um, but, but in Japan, it's a criminal offense. Um, so he said, like, you should go to the police. This is outrageous. And your, your um, psychological reaction is completely appropriate. Um, I can give you something for the anxiety if you want. Um, but the cause, his, his diagnosis was that the cause was external or not. I wasn't losing it. It was quite funny when he read the messages. I was just watching his, <laughs> like, some of the things they were saying to me. Well, yeah. And one of my responses, um, you know, to, to, um, I mean, I, I can't really call her a friend at this point, but you know, uh, um, you know, when I get sort of, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I get sort of like accused of being, you know, like depressed and, and not letting go and all that kind of thing is, you know, I just say, you know, look, it, you know, just exactly what you said, which, which is like, you know, it is completely appropriate for me you know, for me to be angry, for me to be depressed, for me to be sad. This is situational depression, anger, and sadness. This is not an internally driven, this is externally driven. And so, you know, I could go to counseling, but that's not going to change the situation. And so probably I would just be pay like I would be paying somebody like like you did to say, you know what, that's a totally appropriate response to what you've been through. And so I already know that. 
And so I don't really want to pay to go get counselling, to be told that. <laughs> we should say, though, if you do want to pay to get counselling, that might be a good thing to do. Um, it might help. You know, it might help you. But if you want to get counselling, make sure you get it from a counsellor who is not ideologically invested. If you can't find one, we'll put you in touch with one. <laughs> so just let us know. Um, we have a network. Um, but, but yeah, counselling might help you deal with the feelings, but none of that changes one caveat, one, one inch, the fact that, that all of this is externally caused and that the, the nightmare um, of negative feelings that you're going through right now is not your fault. No, it's not, not you just not being able to, you know, stiff up a lip, as we Brits like to say, you know, to, to, to be able to endure. I mean, being able to endure is, is good, of course, if you can. Um, but there's nothing wrong with you. You know, this, your reaction is normal. Well, right. So my, I guess my point is not, not to criticize counseling. Been there. Also, also, also been there, done that. But, um, uh, but to essentially say, I'm not going to go to counseling to make the people who canceled me feel better. Right. Cause it would make them feel better if I went to counseling because it would validate their, you know, their accusations of my instability, my inability to, you know, recover from this, my, you know, whatever. So I am not motivated to, you know, uh, to go to counseling in order to, to make other people feel better about what they've done. Good. And I'd also like to say, stay angry, right? Stay angry because you should be angry about this stuff. And anger is going to be the thing that changes it, right? Like standing up and, and, and fighting back is, is the only way to, 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 to stop this kind of evil. And it, it, it's, it's an adaptive emotion, you know, right. like, like if you're kind of like one of these. Books. And it's an approach emotion versus a withdrawal emotion. And certainly, you know, both have value. Right. Um, and we, we need to know when, you know, uh, when each one is, is, is used most appropriately. Um, but certainly always withdrawing, always doing sort of the power down emotion of, of the depression or the sadness um, is, is not good. And of course, always the approach uh, anger. But yeah, I mean, it really wasn't until I got angry that I started to feel better. Yeah, I mean, really. It, it's really important because we have this kind of, I, I think anger is given such... A bad rap. Yeah. Because <laughs> we know, right? Like, we know somebody who's always getting angry at everything. Like, it's obvious that what's bad about that because we can see gangsters and that kind of thing. You know, we can see people who behave like that. And it's obvious to see how pathological that is. But it's also pathological not to have any anger. Right. If you let yourself get pushed around all of the time, and this is like, you know, this connects with something you were talking about um, in the last podcast when I was going off on the Machiavellian narcissist and you were like, hold on. There's also value to Machiavellian narcissists because not all Machiavellian narcissists would be a force for evil necessarily. They might actually be exactly what is needed um, in order to push back against this stuff. And so, you know, you, you having a, having a dark side, having a little streak of anger in you. And it, it might be the thing that, you know, gets you to stand up for yourself. And again, it might work. It might not work, but it's worth a shot because at the very least, if you turn bar turn around and give the woke mob both barrels and take aim at one of their leaders, which is kind of what I would do, you know, and rip apart their arguments and try and show how stupid their arguments are and so on and so forth. And if you want help, just let me know. Um, then um, we also have a critical thinking course, which will help you with this, but more on that later. Um, but, but yeah, let me know. Um, then, then at least they're going to think twice. They're going to think, well, as I suggested earlier, um, perhaps he might, he, she, they, whatever your identity is, um, might not be the easiest targets and perhaps we should move on to someone else. Good. Okay. Then phase five is expulsion. Yes. Um, the target is forced to leave the organization either by being dismissed or through constructive dismissal because working conditions are, uh, intolerable. The targets may find, uh, that they're completely expelled from the labor market and unable to find another job. Now, um, this in in my case, um, it would be very hard. I'm sure that they could still make it happen. Um, but what they have done is make me 
is marginalized me to the extent that um, that I'm no longer really a part of anything, a part of the department, a part of, so no more, you know, I lost my administrative appointment. Well, it expired. Um, and I, uh, offered to continue cause they had no plan and there still is no one, you know, doing that job. They hired somebody part-time from the outside to, to, to do a little bit of the, the work. Um, uh, and lost the research lab, the entire, you know, all that stuff that I had worked 20 years for, for the good of the department. So no one has filled that, the void in terms of the uh, compliance uh, office on campus. And no one has filled that void in terms of the, the research in, in the department. So all of these things, essentially these uh, lay fallow, right? And um, one of the things I've noticed is uh, that I'm essentially a ghost to the extent that they pretend that those that that those um, fallow grounds don't exist. So they they you know um, I it's it's like I'm the only one that can see them because they don't see them. It's just a further sort of uh, way of of. Um, expelling me. So I'm, you know, sort of, I'm, you know, there's an expulsion, but I am still, I know I'm still physically there, but it's as if, um, there are no, we're no remnants. There's no remnants of me ever having been there. And I'm, you know, kind of a ghost. And they haven't replaced, you know, they haven't replaced anything. What's, what's it done for the research output? There is, there essentially. yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is this is the point. This is what happened, right? So the administrators, I don't know, maybe they were ideologically invested or probably more likely they thought whatever, anything for an easy day. They went for the easy day. Maybe they got a brief period of peace. They'll get more mobbings in the future, of course. But in the meantime, they've just destroyed their research output. Right? That's what it does to your, your institution. Any institution you let this 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 rock get involved in, because it's evil, right? And and and, and evil cannot create anything new, right? It can it it just destroys. It destroys. It destroys. It destroys. It doesn't make anything anything new. Like in order to make something new, you have to be thinking about the best interest of somebody other than yourself, right? Um, like you with your lab, like with the research projects you did with your students, you went, you know, you, you've talked to me about this. You weren't thinking just about Elizabeth Spee, like me, 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 me. You were thinking way beyond yourself, right? And that's because you were thinking beyond yourself. That's why you were creating things. If you're just thinking about me, 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 then you'll just destroy everything around you to, to achieve short, short term gains for yourself. Mm-hmm. And that, that's why these people are inherently destructive. And that's what it does. So what it the- does everywhere. It's interesting because um, in the, in this um, article, right above that, the table that we were just talking about, um, that you know, the, one of the most common traits of mobbing is that the targets are are highly achieving. Um, they're good at their jobs, usually popular with colleagues or students. They tend to speak out against unethical behavior. They're intolerant of hypocrisy. Um, and um, many mobbing targets love their work. They derive purpose and pleasure from it because targets tend to be forgiving. It's difficult for them to accept that another human being could knowingly cause such cruelty. They suffer grave injustices often for years without recognizing the problem. Um, And so I, I do think that, um, you know, that there, there, you know, certainly I uh, sort of went about my, there were probably, I probably should have or could have seen that people uh, resented me for being, for, you know, being, for for having created the lab, for having created the institutional review board process, for, um, you know, having, for doing the majority of the, you know, the the subject pool research for essentially keeping it going. Um, and And I didn't see it. Right. I just like I just like a little work. I just love my job and I love, you know, love doing my research and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And and um, and yeah, it's like, you know, you, you sort of like have this vague awareness, but it's like, oh, it's transitory. It's, you know, whatever. It's a minor thing. Maybe I should have seen those kinds of things. Right. 
Um, but I, I thought that was, uh, it's sort of, you know, part of what you were just talking about. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, so like where I work, there are groups of people who would enter into something that they call reflective practice. Um, and it's interesting to find out. So, you know, you sit down and you reflect upon what was good and what was bad about what you do. And if you listen to these people in their reflective practice, they, they don't rate themselves. Like um, this is correlation thing. So this is purely anecdotal. There's not any research on this. This is just something that I've noticed that the people who I've known who go about with the mobbing behavior, who, who try and stir up the mobbing behavior, not necessarily people on the sides who just kind of the compliance side of things. I'm not, not talking about that. The people who actually instigate the mobbing behavior. Um, when you listen to them reflect upon their jobs as teachers, they rate themselves very, very lowly. They're moaning. They don't think they're very good at their jobs. Um, mm. They have a very, they don't think that they're very confident. And they're not, mm. but they're not very confident. I don't think they're very confident either. <laughs> Actually, out of them, I think one of them is. One of them's, one of them that I know, I'm not going to use they again because I don't want to identify them, but one of them, they think they're terrible at their job, but I actually think they're pretty good at their job. Horrible individual, but but actually their <laughs> job as a, well, morally, because you're behave, if you're participating right. in this kind of behavior, you have to be. Yeah, I, mean, like, I agree. Um, so absolutely horrible individual, but somebody who is good at their job, in my opinion, mm. although when you listen to their reflections, they are not confident in their abilities. Um Whereas me, like I love teaching, absolutely adore it, and I get on really well with students. Um. So yeah. So I was trying to find, um, and maybe it's maybe it's right here. Um. Let's see. Uh, bullying bosses frequently uh, intimidate those who have the skills to do the job better than they do. They diminish the confidence and integrity of others in order to deflect attention from their own inadequacies. Um, but then I, and I know that you, you, I'm sure that you like this part of the article. Over 90% of all the cases reported in the UK National Workplace Bullying Alliance, a uh, bullying advice line involves serial bullying. One in 30 people is a serial bully with sociopathic traits. I, I know you would pick up on that. Their behavioral, uh, profile uh now look uh well uh, let, uh, let me read this let me read this first and then i'll their, their behavioral profile includes compulsive lying a jekyll and hyde nature superficial charm considerable capacity to deceive and uh, an arrested level of emotional development and a compulsive need to control serial the serial bully likes to play people off each other they are gratified by manipulating and watching others destroy each other um, so one in 30 people is a serial bully, is a serial, is a serial bully with sociopathic traits. Now, when I go to the supposed, the supposed citation for this, um, I just, I haven't read, I, I just, yeah. I know when I, I mean, read that, what, I thought that was a stretch. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, stretch. where, where did we find these people and did what kinds of, you know, so I would need to go to the, to the literature. However, it does it, this very broad, uh, statement with no, uh, you know, no research support here. Okay. I mean, there's a citation, but, but, you know, we haven't read it and it, it's certainly not in the article, the, the, you know, support for that or the what study or whatever it was. Um, it does, ref, it, it, it does sort of match up with the, the dark triad stuff that we had talked about in a couple of other podcasts. So I don't want to totally brush it off. Right. I also, you know, but, but remain I think, I think uh, somewhat skeptical. We... Out of the dark triad, so the, the narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy, I think sociopathy, psychopathy, I mean, same thing really, right? Um, I think that when we looked at the data, or when, more to the point, you looked at the data, didn't the psychopathy drop off? Yes. Right? Yes. So, but, but these are still similar traits that they're talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, I think so it's important to this be accurate. idea of being... But the idea of manipulating and watching others destroy each right, other. Right, but that's not necessarily yeah. psychopathic. And I think... Well, no, I was thinking that's more... Machiavellian. a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. So, so, yeah, so I think 
calling them sociopathic is probably the wrong thing because right. it, one of the articles I think was the last one we well, looked at. And the fact is that they just throw in this, right. you know, uh, one in 30 people. It's like, I don't know where that came so, from. So we did, <laughs> we did, um, if you look a couple of podcasts ago, we did like a, a complete, breakdown we looked at the literature of what are the kind of um psychological traits that will predict for people who get involved in mobbings essentially you know woke ideological mobbings um we were careful to say that not all people who have these traits will participate in these mobbings well and and not only that but all of us have these traits to varying degrees and that manifest themselves in different ways in different situations so it's not like we are de- that any of us is devoid of these traits. No. And, and, and in my case, kind of, I think having a bit of, oomph, I don't know, aggression that might be construed as a high degree of psychopathy on a measure on a, <laughs> might be why I'm willing to, I don't know, jump into the fight. Right. And, and that's necessary. So, so we're not even saying that these, these are maladaptive. We're just saying that these kinds of traits tend to the people who behave who participate in these mobbings or who not participate the people who lead these mobbings very likely would score highly on machiavellianism higher higher certainly higher on machiavellianism and, and narcissism than and, the general public and maybe even i might not even go quite as far as you did in saying that but what i might say is that people with those traits might be uniquely qualified to use the example of like the uniquely qualified language that was used against me <laughs> in the in in um the this but they might be sort of um particularly sensitive to let's do let's say that that particularly sensitive to uh the flaws in the software that you mentioned, right? They might be, so certain kinds of cues in the environment might be more salient, might stand out to the, to certain people more. So some of us, we become sort of, you know, we're, we sort of become experts and you and I had taught, we, we just mentioned, even in the context of this podcast, if you grew up in a, um, you know, in a, in a, in domestic violence, then you might be particularly sensitive to signals that might indicate that uh, a potential for violence. Those might be uh, false positives, right? However, they might, you know, they, they might also be, uh, uh, indicate a vulnerability. So it is also possible that, uh, you know, that, that people with certain uh, traits experience, life experiences um, are, uh, are more able to spot these, you know, sort of flaws in, in the system and then maybe take advantage. And let's flip it on its head. Um, before the woke people started going after me, I was going after them, right? Not, not, not individually. I was going after their idea. I didn't go after anybody individually. I was going after the ideology and I was exposing the ideology. So does that make me high in Machiavellianism? Because I can spot all of the, all of the little rhetorical tricks that they're doing. I'm like, yeah, that's, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, so. Every time we've read an article, we've said exactly that. It's like, wait a minute, we actually see ourselves in here too. And that, that's, that's human nature, right? We are all a little bit of all of these, all of these things. Um, so you might be uniquely, so, if you're Machiavellian, you might be uniquely qualified to exploit these right. uh, vulnerabilities, these system flaws, or to recognize them, or to recognize them and for try the to write them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or to recognize yeah. them in order to try and push back. So it doesn't mean that you're negative. It just means that if you, I mean, look, if I wanted to play woke, I'd probably be quite good at it. Sure. That's yeah. You know. So I really want to. I want to get to um, the, these. This last part because I think it's really important with regard to the mental health. We've already really covered the effects on the organization, but I do think that we need to, um, and, and again, there are better articles than this one about this, but, um, the consequences and, um, you know, that, that, uh, this sort of alienation that, that we've described, you know, targets don't understand because they have no frame of reference, no language to describe what is happening. When their attempts to change the situation fail and they feel uh, all avenues have, uh, have been exhausted, they, they're pushed sometimes um, as far as uh, suicide or even 
uh, murder, suicide. Um, so the feelings of doubt, shame, worthlessness, worthlessness humiliation, unhappiness, desperation. Um, so you're, you, you're, you're alienated from your colleagues. You're alienated from your friends, sometimes even from your families. Um, if you're yep. forced out of your job, you, you know, you, um, you know, you you have financial stress, um, you know, the, the shame and humiliation that comes from having lost your job. So this is, um, you know, this is not to be, um, minimized, right? This is, you know, this is a cost. Um, you know, I think that organizations sort of think of it as a cost of doing business, but this is a, there's a human here. There's a human cost. The level of cruelty, the level of uncaring that it takes to, for a, you know, an entire organization to watch a person be destroyed, to watch someone lose their livelihood, their health insurance, and then eventually their physical and mental health, their relationships, their, you know, their, their personal lives is just, it's, it's beyond my comprehension. What possible crime could fit that punishment. We treat, you know, uh, uh, certainly most white collar criminals far better than this. And those are people who have actually committed a crime. I'm not going to go so can far I, as to say, you know, to, can, I, to can, go I, to the, can I hazard a, um, a term? I think it's torture. I mean, it's, it's psychological torture. You, you, you are accused of doing something not only that you would never do, but something that your whole identity is invested in pushing back against, such as in our cases, racism, homophobia. You know, like, it's awful. I mean, wouldn't, I'd always put, and have pushed back against those things, you know, personally. Sometimes I put myself at risk to push back against those things before. Certainly homophobia, I've pushed back at risk um to myself um but anyway so we're, we're um sexual um predators i push back against the sexual predator who was powerful at my one somewhere we used to work um and that put me at risk because the person was powerful right um so, so so we're being accused of things not only are we innocent of but our whole identities and our whole ethos our whole character is invested in being against and we've actually done stuff to push back against that and then it's flipped on us that, 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 no, we're actually guilty of those things. And that the more that we protest our innocence, the more guilty we are. You know, the whole kind of right, white fragility Kafka trap. Um, and we should just admit that we're, we're this great evil thing. And the promise is, is that once we admit that we're this great evil thing, we're absolved, right? Because they say, oh, we're all racist. But, you know. And of course, we know that, the, uh, that, that if we were to go along with them, we would not be absolved. No we would be tortured even more. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and it's this complete destruction of your character, your, 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 the, you know, gaslighting, your, your, your sense of your reasonable evidence, sense of reality is taken away from you. Uh, and, and you're, you know, just left out there having done nothing wrong. Um, yeah, and tortured. you don't know who you are. You don't know who you are anymore because your identity is, has been. Well, you, uh, you, you don't know. unless you unless you really put your foot down. I mean, that's the only thing you can do to, to protect your identity is to put your foot, is to put your foot down and, and, and try and push back. Well, I would argue that you can't, you know, you can't, pr you, you know, especially in academia, if you, um, you know, if you get pushed out, you know, if you've, if you've gotten a PhD, right. Uh, and you get pushed out, you know, where do you go? So, I mean, that's your identity. That's who you are, right? So it's not like getting a, it's not like, I, I just, it's anyway. Okay. Um, and by the way, uh, I just want to add something. I just want to add something here. Cause this is like, and I've talked about this before. Like this is real. There's evidence that this is happening. If you work in academia, you will feel this. I mean, maybe if you work in a kind of Christian conservative college somewhere in, I don't know, Utah, um, maybe you wouldn't feel it there, but if you work on a university campus, you, you feel this and don't tell me that you don't, don't tell me that you're not walking on eggshells, you know, because there are people out there who will say, oh, cancel culture. It's real. It's happened in this one case and that's bad, but let's put things in perspective. This is not really happening. And the right wing are just using this to explain. We're not right wing. 
Neither of us are right wing. And actually, if you are genuinely right wing, you're far less vulnerable to this because you probably don't work in a university. If you're Ben Shapiro, right? You don't care if somebody tries to cancel you. If, if, if somebody cancels Ben Shapiro and he doesn't get to speak at whatever university he's gone to speak at, he doesn't give a shit. He thinks, right, well, I've got paid for it anyway. And look, I can make a great YouTube video out, out of this. Like it, it benefits him. You're helping Ben Shapiro. The victims of cancel culture are generally not, there might be one or two who are genuinely white. In fact, I know a couple who are right wing who work in universities, but by and large, right wing people don't work in universities. You know, so the victims of cancel culture are mostly people who are left wing liberals, like mostly who are being lied about. Yes. Um, so I did want to, uh, so two things I wanted to go through. We have a list here of reasons why bystanders don't support the target. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of which we already mentioned, you, they just don't really have any understanding of the experience of bullying, manipulation. Yeah. And, I mean, can I give an example of this? Um, cause I think mm -hmm. this is really important. So like I've known, um, decent, thoroughly decent very intelligent and qualified scientists go along with mobbing. Not, not instigate it, but go along with it. And when I talk to them about it and they'll, I talk to them, well, you, you do realize what's going on then? No, of course I realize I'm a scientist. <laughs> yes. That doesn't qualify you for this, right? There are some scientists um, and, and also doctors who are genuinely very smart, genuine experts in their field, genuinely, you know, decent human beings, and they know that they're very smart. So they think that they can intuit the whole ideological landscape. And they know that, of course, it's a good thing and there's nothing wrong with it. Like these people are also out there and it's a problem. And, and they can be, these people who are smart can be the most ignorant people of all. Um, so in, in, in academia, there are lots and lots of very smart people who are also simultaneously very, very ignorant about the ideology. Mm -hmm. Because we're all ignorant right about something well and and also just no understanding again like no understanding of, of the actual it, unless you have experienced this bullying manipulation um psychological warfare you you really yeah. can't understand it um you know i mean number two few have the integrity and moral courage to stand up uh, uh, to a bully they pretend nothing is happening and that it won't happen to them so i cannot tell you how many times people have said to me, you know, including people in my own department who would have attended the, the forums to talk about it, who, who were, you know, on the receiving end of all the emails, you know, even within, so not even just the university, but the emails in the department and that kind of thing, who, who have told me, well, I, I didn't know anything. I, I didn't know any of that was happening. You know, I mean, what a load well, of Well, I met one, crap, right? It wasn't right? in your department, but at Heterodox. Yeah. We, we, we yes. shan't mention his name, but he's at Heterodox no. and parading around like he's all against all of this and he understands what's all wrong with it. And then, yeah, but fine, I'm sure he does. I'm sure he is against all of that. Right. And I'm sure he understands very well, seemed to, based on my conversation with him, that he understood exactly what was wrong with it, why we needed to push back against it. Um, and yet, in and your then case, denied it, that it happened on our own campus. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't know. And I, I mean, funny, because you seem to respond to every other, you know, tribute, trivial email with a reply all, <laughs> but not this one. No, um, they lack the critical thinking skills or analytic abilities. And, and I don't even know if they uh, lack them or have uh, maybe don't aren't confident. We, you know, we saw this in, in, in our, the other articles that, you know, people don't have their their they believe that they can't, um, can I, that they shouldn't engage with this person because they may not do a good enough job. Can I say something narcissistic? <laughs> right. Um, I used to suffer really, 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 really badly from imposter syndrome. Like really, really, really badly. Like people like thought when I was interacting with people, people thought I was smart. I had a reputation for being smart, but I myself thought that I'd managed to deceive people <laughs> into thinking I was smart. I didn't actually believe I was. And so I was always like really, really, really worried about being found out. So to give you an example, um, uh, like um, on um, my MA, um, my, I 
didn't send, you know, like an MA dissertation. I don't know. Do you do dissertations and MAs in the States? I don't know. In the UK, okay, you do, right? So in for my university, it was the word limit was negotiated. So usually it's like 12,000 words, but the word limit is negotiated between the student and the supervisor. So usually if you've super supervised the dissertation, you'd know that the student sends you a chapter, you then give feedback on the chapter and you write like, and then, you know, you construct the, the dissertation over a series of emails and meetings and or meetings. So for my MA dissertation, um, I wrote, <laughs> I was so like, my imposter syndrome was so high. I was so sure that was going to fail that I wrote 25,000 words. And I just sent it on deadline day after getting blind drunk because I needed the drink to get rid of the anxiety because I was sure. And he read through it and he was my, the supervisor was great, loved it. And it was, everything was fine. It was brilliant, but it was not co-constructed. I didn't get any feedback or anything like that. It was just literally, I wrote the whole thing myself because I was so worried um, about being found out. When I got my first job in university, I was worried about being found out again. And then I realized that I wasn't going to get found out that and then I moved up a level to another level university. And I, again, same fear that I was going to get found out and I didn't. And then suddenly I realized I was probably smarter than most of the people around me. And then the greatest one was when I started debating with um, famous academics on Twitter. One of them was uh, Jason Stanley and, you know, just being able to deal with these people with relatively, with relative ease kind of convinced me that actually maybe I wasn't an imposter after all. Um, but what I mean is that, and I don't want to speak too, 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 too highly of myself. That's not the reason why I'm saying this. The reason I'm saying this is that, you know, I'm not impressed with the standards of, um, intelligence and knowledge in academia. Like I, I, I haven't really found evidence that the people I've, I've met in academia are yeah, more I, intelligent. I'm not that impressed. I'm not that impressed with my PhD either. And I'm surprised at how many people are as impressed with their PhD as they are. <laughs> I'm just not that impressed with myself. I have to say. No. And, yeah. And, you know? and, I, and, I, and, I, and actually, okay, I'm going to go even further. I, I, I think that genuinely divergent thinkers in academia, genuinely, I mean, you know, there's a difference between somebody who's, in, who's intelligent, right? Who's able to solve a given task. And somebody who is a creative and divergent thinker, somebody who's able to not just solve a task, but make something interesting and new. In my experience of academia, those people are pushed out. You know, it's not that you can't do it in academia, but it's very, very difficult. Um, yeah, I think, and I think more so now. Yeah, more um, so now. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, bullies poison the atmosphere. And actively poison people's minds against the target to regard the target as a threat to the organization, having a mental health problem. We already talked about that. Um, when there is conflict, most people want to be on, of course, the winning side. Um, some gain gratification, perverse feelings of satisfaction in witnessing the sufferings of someone else. Bystanders see only the good side of the bully. Um, the bully is subtle using, you know, subtle tactics behind closed doors or, um, you know, uh, emails, um, notes, post-it notes, maybe, um, uh, comprising of, of hundreds of, of incidents, um, again, which out of context and in isolation appear to be trivial. So the bystanders don't ever see the full picture. So, when I, tr when I use a single example, and you may have this problem too, when you use a single example, they, they wave it away. And I'm saying, no, this is an example of, you know, again, like this is hundreds of incidents. I'm giving you an example. You can wave away each one of those examples, but I'm the, I'm experiencing all of them. And, you know, to, to, if somebody says, well, you know, well, why didn't you tell me? Because if I told you about every single thing that happened, that is all we would talk about. It's, it's like <laughs> death from a thousand cuts. A thousand That's right. It's cuts. that pervasive. You need to understand that if I called you or texted you or whatever, every time this happened, this is, uh, and that's one of the problems that happens when this is going on. That's all it, it, it becomes all you talk about at home. It becomes all you talk about when you go to the gym, it be, if you allow it to. And and it's as if you don't have anything else, you know, to, to 
to um to or the pub talk about if you're English. No, generous. Or the pub, if yes. You're English, yes. Yeah. Yes. So um Let's see. Bystanders are hoodwinked by the bullies' bruises and abdicating for abdicating responsibility and evading the accountability example. Um, so the example is: that's all in the past. Let's focus on the future. Forgive and forget. You've got to move on. What's past is no longer relevant. Make a fresh start. This has definitely happened to me. But it's not past. It's not past. No. It's still happening. Yes. You're still people are yeah. still maintaining your guilt, which is just ridiculous. Right. And also. Even if you just, even if you just said, "Oh, all is past, is past," then you moved on and, and and everything, and nobody, and they completely, they agreed, and nobody attacks you ever again, and that was all done. Even if that happened, they would move on to other people, and other people would be attacked in just the same way because these, or they'd circle back around. Well, no, they probably to, would. But even if they said, even yeah. if you remove Elizabeth Spivak out of the equation, it's going to happen to other people, right? You, yeah. you can't, you can't, you have to confront this behavior. You can't just let and it. And then, of course. And then, of course, colleagues have their own problems. And they're not going to risk their job for someone else. And I, I, that's, I mean, it's, it's totally legitimate. So um, last but not least, let's not do these things to people. Do not tell the target to snap out of it. It's like telling a depressed person to just quit being depressed. Uh Tell it, do not tell the target that he or she is, was just being too sensitive. Um, don't attribute the problems to a personality clash between two parties because it's bigger. It's bigger than that. Um, don't comment that the target is uh, obsessed with past incidents that, can, that they can't let go of. Um, don't advise targets uh, not to talk about it. Why? Because it supports the secrecy and the confidentiality, the silence that the that the mob is depending on. Also, um, also, talking about it makes it really helps. You know, it does. Like, like you know, talking about it with somebody like us will make you feel, or just listening to this, right, will make you feel. No, maybe it's not me. Maybe I'm not the crazy one. You know, maybe I'm the victim of psychological abuse. You know, actually talking about it makes you feel normal and will help with the feelings. As as you know, because you're listening to us right now, presumably. Right. Hey, when I read this article, I, I think I, I sent it to you and said, holy shit, read this. Yes, you did. I think that was the exact. I think that was the exact. Um, and you've always said, uh, <laughs> you've always said, like in the earlier podcast, when we're looking at the dark triad personalities, you were saying, well, look, this helps because it's cathartic. It helps to know that they, they're you know, malevolent people behind all of this, but we can't do anything. And I was like, no, we can predict how they're going to behave. And here's an example of me predicting how they're going to behave. So I think it might even help you from a tactical point of view as well, if you talk it over with other people, because there are certain strategies that work. Listen to the Dark Triad podcast. I go over them. <laughs> <laughs> He's very enamored with the Dark Triad. Probably because I am um, on myself is what I'm incredibly <laughs> starting to think. Um, um, do not assume that the target is um, is partly responsible for the conflicts. Um, fear and guilt are the two main emotional in, uh, inflictions imposed on the target, and so to um, you know to reinforce that is um, is very damaging. Um, uh, don't suggest uh, a mediator, um, and this this happened uh, to me. Well, oh, you know, we'll get. Yeah. 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 Um, who will work, who will, it, it just, it doesn't work. It does not diffuse conflicts. Um, it just gives the bully an opportunity to put up a good front, right? Um, just like in domestic violence, um, you know, don't be judgmental. Um, and, uh, psychological abuse is not obvious to the naked eye. It's not like bruises and black eyes and, and that kind of stuff. So each in, in each individual incident may appear petty and trivial, but it's the pattern and progression of the sum of these events that uh, that uh, results in workplace mobbing. And the real losers, this is the last line of the article. The consequences of inaction are enormous for everyone, but the real losers in the academy are the students. I mean, that's long, long term, but 
and that not, certainly played out in my know, case. Not, you know, because the students don't get to participate in research. Um, people mm-hmm. are pushed out. Teachers invest less to, of their identities into their jobs. They don't put the same energy into the classes as they once have done, once would have done. Diversity of thought. So they when they're not given the opportunity to explore ideas. But also, I mean, we talked about in the last podcast, like that they got no chance. That like they're, they're all so fragile now. Like they're, they're they're being inducted into this kind of moral culture in which victimhood is 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 virtuous, revered. And so that just allow, allows the narcissists to kind of kind of manipulate things and pretend to be victims. They rise to the top because they they have the, the kind of personalities that, that, that make them good at doing that if they want to. And of course, not all of them do. But then the other thing are the real kind of critical social justice believers who were just a complete mess because they, they think that they're constantly being bombarded with all kinds of signs of white supremacy and, and they believe it's real and they live in this state of victimhood. Not not at all dissimilar to the kind of victimhood that we're describing in this article. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's a crime really against the students and the individuals um, who are being targeted. Shame on them. Shame on whoever kind of like shame on the the people who are pushing this kind of mobbing, but also shame on the, particularly the people who know that it's going on um, and are trying to explain it away. Oh, you know, the whites are real problem. No, they're not. I mean, I'm not or saying just the right look the other way. Or just look the other way. Or just look the other way, yeah. And we're just destroying the academy by letting this stuff take, yes. take hold. Jolly good. On, um, that, on, that, on that positive note. Tips for targets? <laughs> Maybe? Um, you know, I mean, one of the reasons why I didn't cover that is because I really... Um, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't impressed with the tips for Target. No, it just says fight um, back, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. I mean, there's 12 of them here and they basically all, you know, I mean, consider legal advice. I mean, I'm sorry, but you know what? I mean, um, yeah, there's a few people who've won a, who've, who've won a, a case here or there. Um, you know, look at the, the, um, the Weinsteins, you know, you were just talking about the Evergreen State College thing, you know, I think they got 600 and some thousand dollars. I'm sure they had to give part of, some of that to the, to the lawyer. Right. I mean, they're, they're in their, they're in their forties for crying out loud. That's all they got. You know, you, you, you know, that's, they got to pay their own health insurance now. They got, you know, I mean, it's like, that sounds like a lot of money uh, until you got to give it, give half of it to the lawyers and you got to figure out how to make a living when you're essentially unemployable. Right. So, um, so I don't know if, um, you know, I, I don't know how, how valuable, uh, um, you know, uh, advice that is, you know, confront the bully, uh, put it in writing. Um, one, I will say this one thing that I think I wish I would have done and that others, uh, very few people have the discipline to do, um, is to document everything. So I think that becoming a, you know, if, if you are already, uh, uh, a journal writer, uh, you know, if you're, you know, journaling in, uh, maybe of an evening or something before bed, there's lots of, you know, psychological literature that says, you, you know, that this is helpful. That's a whole different, uh, a whole different podcast, but, um, you know, for the purposes of, um, you know, if, uh, 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 pushing back, um, these are, you know, it's a documentation, right? It's a record. And to try to, uh, to, to reconstruct those thousand cuts is, uh, it would be just be impossible. So if you're not a journaler, I think becoming one is, is definitely good advice. Um, and if you are one, then certainly include all of this kind of thing. And I didn't do that. And I still don't do that. And, uh, that's a discipline thing. It's, it's, it's a, you know, it's hard. Crazy, to yeah. discipline weakness, yourself to weakness do it. of the will it's like you know yeah it is it really is yeah. it really is even knowing how valuable it is um so um you know i mean i just i don't see anything all that uh honestly all that useful so i mean it does say you know use available resources on the internet knowledge is power join um join groups on uh support groups online and we are you know. going to be introducing something about that very shortly hopefully um where we we appreciate how value i mean even for us just having this conversation and hopefully you listening just you know this is this is helpful just by knowing that you know you're not it's not your fault 
um, there's nothing wrong with you and actually you're the victim. So that that's helpful. But but really being able to talk to people who are going through similar things to you is is, is invaluable. Um, and, and to try to make sense out of something that doesn't make any sense and knowing that, um, you know, that, that other people are trying to make sense of it too. Right. Is very helpful. So we're going to try and create something well not us but we're going to help bring to light some services that will be useful for you and and maybe we will participate as well i guess uh, at some point um but there there are some people that we'll, we really trust that we're working with um that we think will will be a benefit for you because we know how how alone you must feel really um if you're a victim and even if you're not a victim, even nobody, if nobody's turned on you, how alone it feels to be, how stressful it feels just to, you know, thinking, when are they going to come for me? When am I next? Because you never know, right? Um, it reminds me of Solzhenitsyn as a, in um, the Gulag Archipelago, um, you know, where the Soviet Union, they're basically inventing reasons because they always need the oppressor class, right, in order to justify their own failures. So they're always inventing reasons why somebody, this person is a traitor and some of them are loyal Bolsheviks and the rest of it. And uh, there's actually uh, one guy, he gets arrested. And when he gets arrested, he's actually relieved. He's like, finally, <laughs> it's actually happened. I can stop worrying about it. Um, so, so yeah, you know, it, it, it's just even if you're not a victim, even if you've skillfully um, managed to stay under the radar, um, it's still stressful, isn't it? Because, you know, that or if like, you've just watched, if you've watched it happen to somebody else, you know. And that feels awful. Yeah, that feels pretty awful too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I, I think discussion is important. We're going to try and help as much as we can in that regard. Um, but to conclude, I think I'd just like to say the most important thing at this stage is to say that it's not your fault. And if you are targeted, you don't necessarily have to fight back. Although I would urge you to, I would say it's your moral responsibility to, but, but Hey, I mean, I'm the least. It's not for everybody. No, and and I'm the least conflict averse person in the world, and so it's kind of like I'm, don't, not everybody's like me, and not everybody has the kind of that I have. Um, so so it isn't for everybody, but at the very least, don't accept guilt because that will only make things worse. Um, and also the one thing I would say is take heart. Evil has been here in the world before, and. In the end, the forces of liberalism have prevailed in every time, and I think they will do again here. We may be seeing that beginning, things beginning to change, I think, in popular culture. Um, we'll see. Good, thank you very much.